Ja, hallo. Schönen guten Morgen. Kommt alle rein zum Closing Event. <lacht> ja, nochmal schönen guten Morgen nach dieser durchtanzten Nacht. Ähm, wir begrüßen euch ganz herzlich, ganz herzlich zu diesem Abschluss-Event. Genau, hallo auch von mir. Ähm, kurz zum Programm. Wir haben jetzt nur schon eine Viertelstunde später angefangen. Ist auch in Ordnung. Wir haben Sonntag. Wir haben viel gemacht die letzten Tage. Und wir haben jetzt aber noch mal zwei sehr interessante Redebeiträge. Wir haben einmal Manon Aubry, die auch hier vorne schon sitzt, die uns einen Input geben wird und danach Tommaso Fatoni. Und wer genau diese Menschen sind, werden wir später noch mal kurz einführen. Und danach gibt es noch abschließende Worte. Ihr werdet zwischendurch natürlich auch noch mal die Möglichkeit haben, selbst zu Wort zu kommen. Und äh, dann ist sie auch leider schon vorbei nach diesem Event hier, die ESU 2022. So, aber vorher, äh, natürlich gibt es immer noch die Möglichkeit oder wir müssen jetzt noch mal ganz viel Danke sagen. Dafür übergeben wir kurz noch mal ans Organisationsteam. Guten Morgen, da sind wir noch mal. Ich hoffe, ihr seid fitter als ich, aber es sieht nicht so aus. Setzt euch hin, hört zu. Ähm, äh, büff, ja. ja, die Veranstaltung war, glaube ich, ziemlich gut. Ähm, ich möchte die Chance nutzen, ähm, mich zu bedanken bei den Leuten, die mich seit einem Jahr äh, fett unterstützt haben, das Ganze hier aufzubauen. Ähm, und ich würde bitten, ein paar Leute mal kurz hier nach vorne zu kommen, die ganz vielen Ehrenamtlichen, die hier seit einem Jahr geplant und angepackt haben. Und zwar für das Kulturprogramm sind das Harald und Thomas. Ich, ja, da. Für alle Filme und Ausstellungen und so weiter. Ich rufe einfach mal ein paar Leute auf. Frauke übergibt ein paar kleine Dankeschöns und dann machen wir vielleicht eine große Riesenapplausrunde, wenn wir alle hier haben. Die Helferinnenkoordination, die euch seit fünf Tagen in den Hintern treten, überall mit anzupacken. Tamara, Ralf und Andreas. Die äh, Dolmetscherinnen haben wir gestern bedankt, aber es gibt eine Person, die die ganzen Dolmetscherinnen äh, organisiert hat und das ist Maria Wahle. Das Cafeteria-Team mit wirklich wahnsinnig tollen Getränken und Snacks und alles, äh, organisiert von Ruben. Die Exkursionen für alle die, die auch mal raus wollten aus diesen vier Wänden, organisiert von Eva und von Sondos. Die Technik. <lacht> Neben unseren Hauptamtlichen haben auch Ehrenamtliche die Technik mit organisiert und zwar vor allem Siggi und Marvin. <lacht> Kein Siggi da. Doch, da ist Siggi. Und dann haben wir von Attac Deutschland noch vier wundervolle Praktis, die auch seit Wochen im Dauereinsatz sind. Praktikanten, Praktikantinnen, Franziska, Maxim, Angela und Jotam. Die passenderweise ganz hin. Ähm, genau, ihr braucht noch einen Moment, dann ähm, möchte ich das Ganze abrunden mit, das war ja ein internationaler Kongress, äh, mit der internationalen Vorbereitungsgruppe. Ich habe überhaupt keinen Überblick, wer noch hier ist. Ich lese einfach mal ein paar Namen vor und wer sich hört, kann gern mal kurz nach vorn kommen. Der James, Christophe Aguichon, Alice Picard, Dirk Friedrichs, Hugo Braun, Dorothy Guerrault, Dominic Plihon, Marika... Hélène, Isabeau, Andreas Fisan, Janne, Jean Robert, Verwen, Thomas Sablowski. Oder 
ihr, genau, ihr winkt einfach mal, das ist vielleicht auch ganz gut. Also ein paar sehe ich, einfach mal wild winken. Gut, das war es erstmal von meiner Seite. Ich gebe nochmal an Frauke. Ja, ganz herzlichen Dank. Christiane, bleib mal hier. Und Hugo würde ich auch bitten, weil jetzt mit den beiden stehen hier, glaube ich, die beiden. Der eine, der mit seinem unermüdlichen Einsatz, vor allem auch verbalem Einsatz und nachher tatkräftigem Einsatz, dafür gesorgt hat, dass diese ESO stattfindet. Unser Internationalist Hugo Braun, der in Attac Deutschland... Ja, bitte, klatschen. der seit Jahren darauf bestanden hat, dass wir wieder eine europäische Sommeruniversität brauchen. Dann kam Corona, dann zeigte sich, jetzt können wir wieder Veranstaltungen machen. Wir haben es gemacht und Hugo, wir sind dir enorm dankbar dafür, dass du uns alle so angetrieben hast, dass wir das gemacht haben. Glaube ich, glaube, es ist ein super Erfolg. Ganz herzlichen Dank. Hugo ist derjenige bei Attac Deutschland, der auch immer dafür sorgt, dass wir über unseren nationalen Tellerrand hinaus gucken und schauen, was sich im europäischen Netzwerk noch so tut. Ganz, ganz herzlichen Dank. Und ihr alle kennt Christiane. Ich glaube, niemand auf dieser ESU hat noch keinen Kontakt mit Christiane gehabt. Ich saß oft oben im Orga-Büro und dann streckten Leute den Kopf rein und sie sagten eigentlich immer dasselbe. Ich suche Christiane. So. Und dann ging es um solche Sachen wie banal, da muss eine Tür aufgeschlossen werden. Dann ging es aber auch um ganz wenig banale Sachen wie mein Auto ist abgeschleppt worden. Hört ihr noch? Ich weiß nicht, wo es ist. Und... Christiane hing dann zwei Stunden am Telefon und hat bis ins, glaube ich, OB-Büro rein telefoniert, um ein Auto, das abgeschleppt worden ist, am Wochenende wieder auszulösen. Und natürlich hat sie ein ganzes Jahr vorher als sozusagen Leiterin, sage ich jetzt mal an der Stelle, des hauptamtlichen Orga-Teams hier geackert und hier unermüdlich war sie im Einsatz. Und was ich gehört habe, ich habe das nicht geschafft. Ich glaube, du warst auch unermüdlich dann abends noch dazu im Feiereinsatz. Und hast es dann geschafft, morgens, hast es dann geschafft, morgens hier wieder fit und koordiniert da zu sitzen und zu sagen, okay, was ist das nächste Problem, das ich lösen soll? So, Christiane steht. Ja. Ja. Das musst du jetzt, <lacht> das musst du jetzt aufhalten. Ja, ja. Ja. ja, das ist ein total verdienter Applaus. Christiane steht auch ein bisschen stellvertretend für alle aus dem Büroteam, alle Hauptamtlichen hier, die auch ganz viel hier noch mitgearbeitet haben, die sich reingeschmissen haben über ihre Arbeitsgebiete hinaus. Ja. Genau, ganz herzlichen Dank an alle. Und ja, jetzt eine noch gute, erkenntnisreiche, schöne Abschlussveranstaltung wünsche ich allen. Moment, Christiane. Christiane durfte sich ihr Täschchen aussuchen. Danke. Ja. Danke euch beiden. Ja, danke an Christiane und Frauke für die Danksagungen. Ähm, genau, ich möchte euch an dieser Stelle kurz ähm, unsere beiden Inputgeberinnen vorstellen. Wir haben zum einen Manon Aubry hier ähm, und Tommaso Fattori. Manon Aubry, Sekunde, ähm, ist eine französische Politikerin und seit 2019 Mitglied ähm, des Europäischen Parlaments und dort Co-Vorsitzende der Fraktion Die Linke im Europäischen Parlament und sie gehört zum Zusammenschluss der, 
der NYPS genannt wird in Frankreich. Und Tommaso Fattori ist Politiker aus Italien und er hat das erste Europäische Sozialforum mit organisiert, war am Aufbau des Alternativen Wasserforums beteiligt, am Alter Summit und an Florenz 10 plus 10. Und jetzt würden wir als nächstes Manon bitten, uns einen kurzen Info zu geben. Und ihr habt danach natürlich auch die Möglichkeit, noch Fragen zu stellen. Thanks everyone. Hi, hi to everybody. Um, first of all, thanks very much for the invitation. I'm going to speak half in English, half in French. Unfortunately, my German is not advanced enough. Uh, but yeah, thanks to the interpreters uh, to, to do the job, I'll start in English and, and speak there uh, then in, in, in French. Um, I've, been, I've been asked to talk about the connection between politics and social movements. And I should start from where actually I started. I've been, and I consider myself still as an activist nowadays, I've been working for years for NGOs, I've been working mostly in Africa on the human rights impact of uh, extractive industries, so I've seen a little bit of uh, extractive industries um, um, images there. And then I've been working uh, for Oxfam on tax justice and inequalities. At that time, I hated politics. And I still hate it. Yeah, so you would ask myself, well, then you're hating yourself. Well, sometimes I'm hating yourself. But the reason why I'm telling you, it's because back in 2019, when La France Insoumise came to me and said, well, do you want to lead the list for the European election? I was like, no way. No fucking way. And there I am, three years later, talking from the political side. The reason I'm telling you my story, it's because it raises a lot of questions on how do we change that fucking world? And how do we do it? Well, when they came to me, Yes, I said myself, no way. No way because I hate politics, it's violent, it's sexist. There's no young woman, there's no one that I can identify myself. And then I asked myself, well actually, that's the problem. That there's no one I can identify to in politics. And the second question I had to myself was like, okay, I'm working for Oxfam, I'm tracking tax dodgers, I'm campaigning, Am I not having more impact there than in politics? Well, it's true, but then I thought again, and I was thinking, well, actually, to change the life of people, we haven't found any other way than just one thing, changing policies. And to change policies, we need for sure strong social movements kicking the ass of politicians. But at some point, we need the right people pushing for the right button into the parliaments. That's how, from the small door, I entered, I entered that, that world that is still not mine, that I still hate, but that I still believe that we need that world to actually change things and change politics. And this is the reason why I'm here today, because I do think we need coordination, we need common push from social movements and from the political world. Of course, there's still two different worlds. And I'm not saying anyone here in the room, you should enter into politics. No, please, stay, stay as, a, as activists. We need you from the parliament. When we are on our own, you know, denouncing some of the um, worst free trade agreements, like the last one that they've just signed with New Zealand. I've seen CETA here, but like, they've, they have, at least 10 others um, in, in preparation at the European level. So sometimes we feel on our own, but we know that we're stronger when we have strong social movements outside of the parliament. And that's also a little bit of the story of um, the, the, the NUPS, I don't know how you pronounce it, a new coalition um, in, in France that have been built basically on how do we connect 
some of the left movement and some of the social movement. In France, as you may know, there have been quite a few social movements over the last few years. There have been the Yellow Vest, the climate movement is quite active. There's been a movement against the reform on pensions. There have been a strong feminist movement. There's been a strong movement also against police violence. What we've done is just like stay where we are. When you're a political movement, of course, you should not take the leadership of those movements, but you should push it, you should protect it. And at the time of the Yellow, yellow Vest movement, no one within the uh, political spectrum, including in the left, but the France Insoumise were like, okay, we need to hear what they have to say. This movement is actually a movement for tax justice. What they were saying is actually the richest should pay more and the poorest should pay less. This is nothing else but a social movement that we should actually support. And that's how we build our campaign for the presidential election. You know, the presidential election, the campaign in France is very long. It lasted for a year and a half. We started, we were about 8% in the polls. As you may know, we ended 19% in, in uh, uh, total result. We did it without at any moment, any sort of, you know, compromission. At no time we were like, oh, you know, we should compromise, blah, 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 blah. No, we are radical and we're actually proud to be radical. And, and it's because we've been radical and clear on the proposals we've been making, because we've been hearing the social movements, because we've been building on the social movement, that actually we've managed to reach that point. And that's one of the lessons learned. I'm not saying we did perfectly. At the end of the day, we did not win, but we did made, make some progress. No one would have bet on us. No one would have thought that we were just like a few thousands of votes from reaching the second round. And the reason why we managed to do so, it's precisely because during the campaign, we, you know, we, we, we thought that, yes, those themes, we could bring them forward, we could talk about it, we should talk about, you know, we should defend Muslims when they are attacked by the far right. Um, we should, as well, you know, have a strong radical climate and social message that should uh, go together. In other words, we should break those, you know, sometimes artificial barriers between what we call societal issues, like racism and this kind of feminist issues, and social issues. We should break barriers between social and climate issues, because th those issues are interconnected. And it's because we managed to bring those together that we reach uh, that point. The way we do consider politics as well is to be useful. To be useful is, you know, even at the time when there's no election, we've been doing a lot of concrete solidarity actions, um, like uh, food collection, especially during the COVID time, especially for youth people, for young people that lost their job during the COVID time. We've been organizing as well concrete campaigns for people to learn about their rights, what we're doing, including that summer, if we do that every summer, we have a sort of caravan that is going all across France, only in poor suburbs, you know, this banlieue that we have in France. I'm sure you have similar in Germany with these very high towers where they park uh, poor people in very bad housing conditions. And those people usually l vote less uh, than, than others. And are considering even themselves as like half citizens. We do consider them as full citizens. And we've been working a lot outside of election to actually build on their rights, to go where no one else is going but some few associations. And we've been working greatly with those associations. So that's how we reached that point uh, with uh, the results in, in France. It's interesting to see where we do our best results. It's basically among you, young people, the youth, uh, where we do almost uh, 50%. Um, in poor suburbs, um, we usually do more than 50, but there are some areas where we do 70, 80%. It's also interesting to see that actually we can compete the far right. There's no like fatality 
of having the far right very strong among poor people. It's true to some extent in France, but Marine Le Pen and the far right should not be as high over the next couple of years. And the, the way we can, we can fight about it is actually to go there and say how you know, the far right is not doing anything for the poor people, is not doing anything for at, at social level, for example, they are against the increase of the minimum wage, which is the most basic social demand that you can make. But we have to make that fight. And there was some times ago, you know, in France, the Socialist Party, they had this theory from the Fondation Jean Jaurès, um, it's a foundation that's close to the Socialist Party in France, that they said, well, actually, the poor people, they don't vote. So why bothering talking about their issues? We are going to try to convince people in cities. You know, middle class people, they are the ones to vote. It's true, they vote more. But again, poor people are not half citizen. And I think that's one of the key issues as well for us and one of the lessons learned for the left in France is if those categories of people are voting, then we can make a difference. And if we make the participation progress in the election, then we can make a difference. And that's how we managed to have that result in the presidential election, the 19%, and only then we could create the NUPS, Nouvelle Union Populaire, Écologique et Sociale. Now maybe it's time to switch to French so that there are a little bit of uh, French people uh, <laughs> listening. So for a German and English speaker, you can wear your headset or practice, practice your French. And thanks again for the interpreters. Et donc, c'est comme ça qu'on a créé la nouvelle Union Populaire, Écologique et Sociale. On l'a créé non pas parce qu'on s'est dit il fallait rassembler pour gagner. On l'a créé parce que justement, la question du programme et la radicalité du programme avaient été tranchées par l'élection présidentielle. Et donc, quand on est allé voir les Verts, les socialistes et les autres, on leur a dit que ce qui avait gagné à l'élection présidentielle à gauche, c'était bien la retraite à 60 ans, le SMIC, le salaire minimum à 1 500 euros net, la désobéissance aux règles européennes comme les règles de la concurrence ou les règles de l'austérité. Ce sont ces propositions-là qui l'avaient emporté et c'est sur la base de ce programme que nous avons créé cette nouvelle Union populaire, écologique et sociale. Nous avons élargi la base sans rien renier de notre ambition, de notre radicalité et de notre proposition. C'est comme ça que nous avons créé la nouvelle Union populaire, écologique et sociale. Une gauche qui revient à ses fondamentaux, une gauche française, fière de ses valeurs et de sa radicalité, et donc qui s'est présentée ensemble à l'élection législative euh, du mois de juin euh, dernier. Et c'est comme ça que un petit groupe de gauchistes à la France insoumise, né de la tête de quelques-uns, je le dis en toute humilité parce que je n'en faisais pas partie, je vous l'ai dit, je suis arrivée en 2019 en politique, et je n'avais jamais fait de politique avant. Ce, le parti de gauche qui était, qui regroupait que quelques dizaines de personnes il y a quelques années, est passé de 17 députés à l'Assemblée nationale à 75 députés à l'Assemblée nationale au mois de juin dernier. La conviction qui est la nôtre, c'est qu'en continuant à travailler ensemble et collectivement et en soutien aux mouvements sociaux, alors nous allons pouvoir créer cette conjonction, ce changement. Vous savez, il y a une phrase assez célèbre, je crois qu'elle est de Schopenhauer, qui disait « Une idée, au début, on pense qu'elle est folle. À attaque, on le sait très bien, la taxe, la taxe sur les transactions financières. » Il y a 20 ans, 30 ans, quand cette taxe était proposée sur la table, c'était considéré comme une unité folle. Puis, elle est combattue. On sait à quel point elle est combattue. Et maintenant, cette idée paraît presque normale. La taxation des profiteurs de la crise, des super profits, même le Royaume-Uni, même le Royaume-Uni, les libéraux du Royaume-Uni, se sont mis à taxer les entreprises qui font des bénéfices exceptionnels pendant la crise. Alors, pendant des années, on a été des fous, on a été des radicaux. Et puis, petit à petit, on se normalise. On se normalise. Et l'objectif d'après, c'est de prendre le pouvoir. De prendre le pouvoir, mais je le dis, prendre le pouvoir toujours en ayant des mouvements sociaux forts et indépendants. Parce que ce que l'histoire de la France nous apprend aussi, c'est qu'au moment du Front populaire, en 1936, 
Quand en France, on a gagné les congés payés, par exemple, la gauche était arrivée au pouvoir, c'était le Front populaire, c'était une alliance aussi similaire à celle de la NUP. Mais si les congés payés ont pu être gagnés en France, c'est parce que derrière, il y avait des mouvements sociaux qui étaient actifs, qui étaient mobilisés, qui étaient dans la rue, et qui ont poussé, qui ont aussi sécurisé ces avancées politiques-là. Et donc le jour où une gauche de rupture arrivera au pouvoir, en France, en Allemagne ou dans n'importe quel pays, je sais qu'il faudra compter aussi sur la force des mouvements sociaux, sur leur mobilisation, pour continuer à tenir à la culotte, excusez-moi cette expression et pour les traducteurs, pour tenir à la culotte l'ensemble des acteurs politiques et leur dire « ne nous trahissez pas, nous nous continuerons à descendre dans la rue, à nous mobiliser, que ce soit vous ou d'autres, jusqu'à temps qu'on ait ces avancées politiques ». Et d'ici là, d'ici notre prise de pouvoir, je pense que l'agenda politique européen nous offre des opportunités de collaboration et de travail collectif. Prenez les accords de libre-échange qui vont se multiplier encore davantage dans les années qui viennent. Prenez la taxe sur les super-profits. Je vous le disais, quand euh, j'ai déposé mon premier amendement sur la taxe sur les super-profits au Parlement européen, c'était au début de la crise du Covid. À l'époque, on a eu, je crois, 45 voix dans l'hémicycle, notre groupe. Même les Verts avaient voté contre. Et puis, le temps a progressé, le temps a avancé, et au mois d'avril dernier, la Commission européenne, oui, oui, la Commission européenne, a même dit dans ses recommandations que quand même, il serait bien que les États trouvent de nouvelles sources de recettes et que peut-être ces entreprises énergéticiennes qui se font un beurre pas possible sur le dos des citoyens quand ils payent leur énergie, que peut-être il pourrait être envisageable de les taxer. La Commission européenne qui nous donne raison. Alors moi, je suis prudente parce que ce que je vois, c'est qu'il y a des États comme la France qui continuent à refuser ces mesures-là. Mais je me dis aussi qu'il y a des combats à mener en commun et que souvent, on part un peu seul et qu'à la fin, on arrive nombreux. Et je crois que vous en êtes la démonstration. Et pour ça, on aura plus que jamais besoin de la mobilisation des mouvements sociaux. Donc merci à vous et que le combat commun continue à Sala Victoria. Merci. Ganz vielen Dank, Manon Aubry. Wir haben jetzt kurz Zeit für ein paar Fragen, wenn es die gibt. Kommt bitte hier vorne ans Saalmikro. Keine Fragen, der Vortrag war super. <lacht> Dankeschön. Und dann geben wir auch gleich weiter. <lacht> Genau, überraschend jetzt schon. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, allow me uh, to an off-topic digression, which is not actually an off-topic, but would like to thank you for these days we spent together. Um, after three years of pandemics and social distancing, Uh, it was necessary some social closeness and some physical closeness. And uh, uh, it is also spaces like these that allow us to nurture and to reconstruct social bonds in an era of uh, social atomization. And the reconstruction of social bonds is a political act, indeed is a revolutionary act that has to do with uh, also with happiness. And uh, a true social change project must hold together um, environmental justice, social justice and happiness that is uh, the reconstruction of social bonds, that is cooperative relationships and not competitive relationships. Uh, the, these days, we have discussed a lot about the 
dark side of our time. Forgive me for the definition dark side, but I belong to the Star Wars generation. Uh, dark side that is the destruction of nature by financial and extractivist capitalism. And the dark side is also the exploitation, is the job insecurity, is the denial of fundamental human rights all over the world. Um, and it, in, in a word, is the destruction of our own uh, lives. And we could call it in a, in a synthetic way, the multi-level war uh, unleashed by financial and extractivist capitalism. That is, of course, a military war in a strict sense in Ukraine, uh, but also in many forgotten parts of our planet from Palestine to Kurdistan, from Yemen to many areas of Africa. Uh, but it is also the war against the climate and against the environment. Uh, it is the, let's say, the, um, uh, the social war, the war of the rich against the poor, or, or class struggle. Uh, it is the patriarchal war against the women. And 20 years ago, uh, in, uh, in Porto Alegre, then in Genoa, then in the first European Social Forum in Florence, we were saying another word is possible. And of course, we are still saying another word is possible, another word is necessary. Uh, at, at that time, the richest 20% of the world population owned 80% of the uh, planetary wealth. Today, the situation uh, uh, has even worsened only, not the 20%, but the 8%, the richest 8% of the world population on not the 80, but I think 82 or 83 of the, uh, of the uh, planetary wealth. Uh, and uh, you know, the super rich people in, during the pandemics uh, have increased uh, according to Forbes there are 650 more than in 2020. So in short, the polarization of wealth uh, has increased. And incidentally, I say that uh, a single journey into space by uh, Elon Musk of Jeff Bezos pollutes more than one billion people in their entire life. Second point, today we are still in the midst of a global pandemic. And uh, the pandemic is not the result of a chance. Uh, the spillover is a consequence of the destructions of, of ecosystems. Uh, moreover, we would have faced differently in the past years uh, these uh, uh, epidemics um, if we had not cut social and healthcare spending or, and, and we have not implemented the privatization of the public health care system all, uh, all around the world and the, of the welfare in general. And we have fought uh, against uh, intellectual property and against the patenting of vaccines uh, and more generally against the patenting of uh, life-saving medicines. Um, you remember maybe already 20 years ago, uh, we were alongside Nelson Mandela um, fighting for free access to medicines for the treatment of AIDS. And this is uh, exactly what we are doing now for, uh, I mean, for vaccines. Uh, third point of context, the war in Ukraine, in addition to causing deaths on the field, um, is plunging us into an economic and social crisis that is already having disastrous effects. It is the uh, war economy, um, the food crisis in Africa, uh, the high cost of living in our countries, which is, uh, uh, of course, uh, affecting in particular uh, the, the popular classes, we will see in the, in the next autumn. And last but not least, this war 
is taking us back 20 years, uh, even with respect to the now mythical ecological transition, which is another victim, uh, uh, um, war victims, uh, so to speak. So, but if it's true that the war is changing, it is also true that um, there are underlying elements that do not change. Um, an important Italian sociologist, Luciano Gallino, um, has invented a brilliant definition uh, to describe our time. We live in the time, I quote, uh, of the um, class struggle after the class struggle. Uh, Gallino, I mean, ironically, meant uh, that in our post-ideological time, where the media, the mainstream media or the establishment tell the tale that we are all on the same boat. Uh, at the same time, in the meantime, the, the class of the so-called winners uh, continues the class struggles against uh, the class of the so-called losers. Of course, winners is a, 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 is a term much appreciated by those who think that humanity uh, must inevitably divide itself into winners and losers, and we are <laughs> not among them. Uh, but, but likely, uh, there is not only the dark side of the present time. Uh, there is also the bright side. Always look at the bright side of life. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, as the Monty Python says at the end of the life of Brian. And the bright sides are the social movements. The bright sides uh, are the Fridays for Future, Sinsha Rebellion, and in general, the climate and uh, environmental justice movement, the peace movement, the women's movement, the commons movement, the indigenous movement, the labor movement. So, the, the least is long, likely, is long. And on the bright side, there are also the many alternative practices. Manon was um, uh, mentioning the, the, the food collecting during the pandemic. I, I, I mean, the small scale peasant agriculture, the uh, renewable energy communities, um, the social and solidarity economy in Latin America and Africa in particular, uh, the commoning and, and the many practice of mutualism. So all these bright practices, uh, social movements, initiatives, in their diversity have a common ground and, and have a common purpose. So to overcome the destructive uh, um, exploitation of human beings on nature, and this is the, of course, the uh, environmental justice, and to overcome the exploitation of human beings on human beings. And it is the social justice, to be very short. So, uh, and since uh, in this closing event, we are also called to discuss the, the future and the strategies, I think that in order to have an effective strategy, that is a strategy that allow us to win because we have to win because we can't uh, 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 afford to lose uh, and we are running out of time as the uh, also the, the climate justice movement is uh, uh, reminding us every day so in order to have an effective strategy we have to understand and to investigate what our weaknesses are. I mean, our weaknesses as movements. It's not an easy task, but we have to do it. And um, to be very sure, I, I think our weakness does not lie in the analysis. Um, as we have seen well in these days, in the seminars, in the plenaries, uh, we have a correct analysis of the, of the economic model, of the uh, structural interweaving of the different dimensions of the crisis, environmental, health, social. And I don't think that our weakness is, not, um, is even uh, in the proposals on solutions. We have proposals and solutions. Uh, but le let's say so. Unfortunately, being right both in the analysis and in the alternative proposal is not enough. 
uh, having even the perfect solution to the climate crisis, to the social crisis, is not enough. Of course, we don't have the perfect solution, but we have a set of solutions that describe a paradigm, uh, a coherent paradigm. So being right is not enough to affect and to influence the course of the world. Being right is not enough to be effective. It's not enough to change things. It's not enough to change the power relations. And so uh, what is our weakness, uh, in short, is fragmentation. Uh, a geographical fragmentation. Here we are in a in an international meeting, and it is very wise. Uh, but unfortunately, as movements, of course, there are exceptions. Uh, but in recent years, we have mostly closed ourselves within national borders. And the second is a thematic fragmentation. Let me explain. Uh, the water movement, the water commons movement, fight against the privatization of water and public services. And the, um, I don't know, Black Lives Matter uh, fight against the racist discrimination. But there is no space now for stable relationships. Uh, for, there is, uh, I mean, uh, no a common agenda. Uh, nevertheless, if today we want to face the enemy, if we want to stand up uh, to the enemy in a world of global capital, and if we want to change power relations, then we must build stable alliances, uh, at least on a European scale. I know it's not enough, it's better at uh, the worldwide scale, but at least on a European scale, in order to have a common agenda. And uh, in recent years, too often, we run after an agenda imposed by others, imposed by media, imposed by the worst politicians, uh, and so on. But together, we can stop, uh, we can stop following uh, the agenda imposed by others and try to impose our themes. Hence, the proposal that uh, we are addressing you in this, uh, in this moment. I mean, after this university, wonderful university, uh, after the September climate strike called by Fridays for Future, Extinction Rebellion, after other important events of, of the movement, let's meet in Florence from the 10th to the 13th of November, where together with uh, uh, the European networks and movements, we are organizing a four uh, day meeting on the 20th anniversary of the first European Social Forum, but of course looking towards the future uh, and not celebrating, let's say, the past. Uh, the November meeting is just a small step, uh, humble step towards the desire, the creation of a stable reconnection between social movement across Europe. And the, the meeting will be divided in two parts. The first two days are dedicated to initiatives self-organized by networks and movements. And there are 30 meetings self-organized by individual organizations uh, that are already scheduled. And the last two days, that is the 12th and the 13th of November are instead dedicated to a general assembly, a convergence assembly. And we would like to have a real discussion meeting. That is not an assembly where activists talk about their uh, theme. I mean, where environmentalists talk about environment, pacifists talk about peace, and so on, nor an assembly where each organization presents uh, uh, its campaign. The idea we would like to, uh, to ask uh, transversal questions, or if you prefer, intersectional questions, so questions on issues that concern everyone, with the aim of getting a real discussion, uh, which brings out the problematic notes that allow us to make a step forward together and to understand why we are not able, for example, to have a stable connection 
between us. Um, the, the first question, of course, we are still discussing in the preparatory meeting, but more or less the first uh, question is where is Europe going? I mean, what is the role of Europe in a changing world? To be, to be very short, I take the, the uh, geopolitical frame you know, uh, uh, and the war in Ukraine. The, the war, this war is only a piece of a more general uh, geopolitical confrontation. You know that a few weeks ago, the Chinese President Xi Jinping hosted a virtual summit of the BRICS countries I mean, Brazil, India, Russia, China, South Africa. Um, for what purpose? Uh, they said to plan a new global development uh, partnership. So a worldwide uh, hegemonic transition uh, from west to east is probably underway. You know that China and Russia are both creditor countries. Uh, and the Chinese project is uh, now to create a new international monetary order, uh, uh, diminishing or resizing the role of the dollar and of the euro. So, you know, this is an epochal game. Everything is changing. Globalization, as we have known it and as we have fought it, uh, has been hit by many crises, economic, health, uh, environmental, now the war. And and it is clear that now we are facing a process of, I don't know, deglobalization or maybe perhaps of selective re-globalization with a macro-regional uh, configuration. So, and again, what is the role of Europe uh, uh, in a changing world? What is our role of Europeans, of activists? The second question we would like to ask is how can we eliminate the breeding grounds uh, of advancing right. So how can we go from rancor and fear uh, to hope? And rancor and fear are breeding grounds for, for, for the right. So forgive me the, this um, word play uh, with, the, 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 with the word right, but the political right often advances uh, because it gives the wrong answers to right needs or to needs that are uh, right. First of all, the need of protection, of social protection, while the policies of a large part of the so-called center-left are perceived as policies that have left people exposed uh, to the storms of the neoliberal globalization, policies that, that have impoverished, that have uh, worsened people's lives. And, and for example, in Italy, that's very clear. The, the fact that xeno, xenophobia is often stronger where there are no immigrants or where there are a few <laughs> immigrants uh, may seem paradoxical, uh, but just indicates one thing, that xenophobia is not the poison fruit of immigration, but is the, the fruit of the loneliness uh, in which million people have been left in the face of the storm of the globalization of capital, finance, and markets. Third and final question, I've already said about this, so very short, being right is not enough, so why are not we able to make an impact? How can we give strength to our ideas um, in this context of empty democracy? of, I don't know, post-democracy, if you prefer to, to quote uh, Colin Crouch. Um, how to affect the national and European political agenda? So our humble proposal is start with the, the connection. So to conclude, my time is, uh, is running out. I hope I've been able to explain the substance and the heart of uh, our proposal. We are trying to build, let's say, the preconditions for a future convergence that brings together all the bright sides uh, of the present time. Uh, of course, as a priority, we are trying to involve in the November meeting uh, the new generations, um, the movements of the East Europe, 
the movements of the southern shore of Mediterranean uh, area, and of course to give maximum prominence to, uh, to the actually existing uh, movements like the peace movement, the, uh, the, the environmental and climate justice movement, the women's movement, uh, the labor movement, and so on. Uh, the hope, the hope, our hope, is to leave Florence uh, perhaps with a permanent table and the constant relationships between the movements, also uh, 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 in view of a possible common agenda, uh, in order to uh, be able to win together, to go beyond fragmentation, which is weakening us, uh, keeping together social justice, environmental justice, and of course, happiness. See you in Florence, and thank you for your attention. Thanks. Vielen Dank. <laughs> Gibt es Fragen an Tommaso? Ergänzende Statements, Impulse, Ausbrüche. Die müsst ihr natürlich nicht hier austragen. Wir können auch einfach weitermachen. Und zwar würde ich da erstmal kurz an Sonja wieder übergeben. Genau, danke. Ähm Was, was, da kommt doch eine Frage? Okay, dann warten wir. War doch keine Frage? Okay, das war einfach. Aber danke, dass ihr alle gewartet. Nein, okay. Keine, keine. Eine Frage. Bitte einmal ans Saalmikro kommen. I speak in English. Because in Spanish, or in Spanish, I don't know. Okay, in English. Um, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. I have learned a lot about uh, social movement and the relationship with the politics. Um, social movement, I mean movement for social justice, for environmental justice, for climate justice and feminist movement. But I would like to say you something that I think we forgot ecological justice. Ecological justice, from the ecological justice coming the right of nature. And in Spain, we have uh, had a very important social movement, also in COVID. Um, we had a big ecological disaster in Mar Menor, and then people come in and began a new social movement. We get more than 700,000 signatures. The law uh, asked for 500,000. We went, we went to the parliament, and we get that all the politics from the left, from the right, from the center, listen the new social movement that we are fighting for ecological justice. Because right of nature came from 
climate justice, can came for environmental justice, can came for social justice. These are paradigms very important from the last of um, uh, 20 millennium and the beginning of this millennium. But we must think that we must um, fight not only because the people, because um, right for the people, because uh, ecological, climate, ecology, climate justice is very important, but we are thinking that we need to protect the nature because it's good for human right. But I think that we must open our mind and think that we are living in this planet with another um, reality that they are no human, but they have right to, uh, to live. And then is the new thing that I didn't like go without tell you, thanks a lot, but we must think that is good social justice, climate justice, environmental justice, but ecological justice, but can be a new paradigm to fight for nature. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a, yeah, just a small uh, thing. I, I fully agree with you. What you call um, ecological justice, I call environmental justice, but it's the same concept. And I think that is one of the two legs of uh, a social change project. So we need all the three legs, because I think uh, social justice, environmental justice, or ecological justice, that include climate justice, uh, and uh, include, I mean, is a something bigger, so the environmental justice or ecological justice is something bigger than climate. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, I think the social bonds, I mean, what I call happiness, but anyway, we can discuss about it. But um, uh, I just want to say a, a thing that um, the point is there's also this anthropology, anthro uh, anthropo uh, anthropocentric point of view, we are not uh, uh, something that is out of nature. We are part of nature. And you know that everything is interconnected. So the environmental justice or ecological justice has to do with social justice. Because for example, if you have to, to build something, you know, to, for the waste, uh, an incinerator or how you call it, you are going to build it in a poor neighbor not in the rich neighbor. So everything is connected. And I think that this is our aim, but I fully agree with you. This is one of the important things, one of the important elements that we should take in account for a social change project. Thank you, Thank you. Um, Is that noch a frage? Or we wanted nur Fragen zu lassen, keine Co-Referate oder wenn möglich, weil es ist die Abschlussveranstaltung. Nein. Okay, danke für das Verständnis, wir machen jetzt weiter. An uns liegt es jetzt, Maria und mir nochmal diese ähm, Veranstaltung ein bisschen ähm, vorbeiziehen zu lassen, weil diese erfolgreiche, anregende und wundervolle Veranstaltung unserer Europäische Sommeruniversität der sozialen Bewegung geht jetzt zu Ende. Also ihr wart teilweise 650 Menschen, die hier vor Ort waren, aus 20 Nationen. Besonders gefreut haben wir uns dabei natürlich über die Gäste, die auch außerhalb von Europas hierher gekommen sind. Genau, in elf Foren, vier Plenarveranstaltungen, über 80 Workshops, Open Spaces, viele Kleingruppen, 
haben wir uns kennengelernt, diskutiert und hatten viel und eine super Zeit zusammen. Zudem lief fast wie nebenbei noch ein sehr umfangreiches Kulturprogramm. Also ich auf jeden Fall habe gestern Abend nicht mitgetanzt, aber viele Leute tanzen sehen. Es gab zwischendurch auch noch Lesungen, Filme und Theaterstücke. Sehr vieles davon war geplant, einiges ist aber auch noch spontan dazu gekommen und entstanden. Genau und gestern hatten wir die Gelegenheit zum Tagebau nach Garzweiler zu fahren und das von Zerstörung betroffene Dorf Lützerath zu sehen und dabei das Dorf oder die Menschen, die versuchen, dieses Dorf zu schützen, mit einer Aktion zu unterstützen. Und die Gelegenheit möchte ich hier kurz ergreifen, dass es in Lützerath am 27. August eine Demo geben soll ähm, zu Erhalt des Dorfes, damit dort nicht weiter abge abgebaggert wird. Und ab 1.9. brauchen die Menschen in, Lützis, in Lützi viel Unterstützung, ob ihr dazukommt oder ob ihr vielleicht in sozialen Medien unterwegs seid, beobachtet es, bleibt dabei. Und äh, jetzt kommen wir auch schon zu den finalen Sätzen. Danach könnt ihr euch gerne noch im Austausch bewegen oder auch direkt auf die Heimreise gehen. Also was ich zur Europäischen Sommeruniversität auf jeden Fall auch persönlich noch sagen will, ist, dass es ein, würde ich sagen, lange ersehntes Treffen war, nach zwei Jahren Pandemie endlich wieder zusammenkommen zu können, auch sich persönlich zu sehen, zu treffen, auszutauschen. Und ähm, natürlich hat die ESU wiederum deutlich gemacht, was wir brauchen oder wie der Weg aussehen wird, ist internationale Vernetzung grundsätzlich und vor allem in Zeiten von sich zuspitzenden Krisen, wie wir sie gerade wieder vermehrt erleben. Und die Lösung dafür wird auf jeden Fall grenzenlos und global sein müssen. Das wird sich nicht in einem Land abspielen, das werden wir alle zusammen regeln müssen und dabei natürlich auch die unterstützen, die nicht die gleiche Teilhabe haben wie wir jetzt schon. Und ich hoffe, ihr konntet hier alle neue Kontakte knüpfen, habt Impulse bekommen, Motivation vielleicht mitgenommen und auch ein Gefühl von Solidarität, was ihr in eure täglichen Kämpfe mitnehmen könnt. Und wir freuen uns, euch hoffentlich wiederzusehen, entweder auf der nächsten Europäischen Sommeruniversität oder in vielfältigsten Veranstaltungen, Demos, was auch immer es gibt, was Menschen zusammen veranstalten können. Wir wünschen euch dabei gutes Gelingen und jetzt erstmal eine gute Heimreise.